Exterior of a roadside motel parking lot. Dusk. A large spider crawls across the color TV sign in the front window. Water drips from one of the motel's downspouts. A clear placid puddle in the parking lot reflects the dilapidated motel's facade until a sneaker shatters the peaceful water as someone, Ryan, trudges through the puddle. The motel looks empty except for the pristine early 1970s luxury sedan with blacked out windows parked in front of room 119. It's the only car in the lot. Inside the luxury sedan, two leather gloves rest on the back seat. Right beside them, a pickaxe with TM engraved on it. Female hands, the mask, pick up the gloves and slide them on, slowly. Back out in the parking lot, the motel's rundown neon sign out front currently off. Standing underneath it, staring up at it with his hands on his hips, Ryan, a young stoner in jeans and a polo. A broom handle leans against his shoulder. He glowers, damn sign. The neon sign still off. Annoyed, Ryan uses the broom handle to reach up and tap the sign. Back to the neon sign, no change. Ryan scowls. He pounds the broom handle against the sign. Back on the neon sign, this time the motel's name lights up bright and bold. Ryan, exasperated, grimaces. He pounds on the sign next to the no in no vacancy. Finally, the no lights up. Ryan shakes his head. He's about to leave when the driver's side of the luxury sedan opens. Ryan watches Lando LaCosta, a Hispanic man in his late 30s whose slick, smooth, oozing confidence and wearing an expensive suit with Italian leather shoes, ease out of the luxury sedan and walk to room 119, never bothering to throw a glance Ryan's way. He opens the door and slips inside. Ryan's eyes narrow, but the roadside motel attracts a ton of weird ass people. Whatever. He walks toward the small check-in booth. Right up next to the luxury sedan, it's impossible to see through the tinted windows of the car. Even an observant passerby wouldn't know someone was still inside. And paying attention isn't Ryan's strong suit. Reflected on the tinted window, we see Ryan disappear on the back corner of the check-in booth. Seconds later, the porch light next to the booth turns on. Through the check-in window, we see Ryan move to the small TV. He turns the knob. The TV blinks on. Ryan flips through the channels and finds a cartoon. He stares, then laughs. Empty snack bags and beer cans, popular junk food from the 70s, litter the small room. Ryan pulls a joint and a lighter out of his pocket. He sticks the joint in his mouth while flicking the flint wheel on the lighter, close in the flame igniting at the end of the joint. Inside a station wagon, it's nighttime. The young male journalist has a preppy appearance, but his station wagon betrays him. He nervously drums his hands on the steering wheel. The remote countryside on the other side of the window could be anywhere. It's too dark to see specifics. He glances at the rearview mirror. So, what's your secret? Resting in the middle of the back seat, a briefcase. A woman's hand, Lee's, rests on top of it, as if she's protecting it. What? I mean, you're Lee Larson. You're a legend! In the rearview mirror, their eyes meet. Martha Gellhorn and Ethel Payne are legends. I just got lucky. Come on. What advice would you give a newbie? Seriously, I, I, I'm all ears. She looked out the window. We catch a glimpse of her reflection. Advice. She shifts her gaze to her feet, where, between her legs, resting on the car's floor, sits a worn bowling ball bag. My advice, screw journalism, try Wall Street. The station wagon swings into the motel's dark parking lot and eases to a stop. The luxury sedan hasn't moved and the rest of the lot remains empty. Lee gets out of the back seat. In the station wagon, the male journalist cranes his neck to scrutinize the motel. Um, you sure this is the right place? Behind him, Lee reaches into the back seat, grabs the briefcase, and pulls it out of the car. We hear her place the briefcase on the pavement. You see any other motels around here? She ducks back in for the bowling ball bag. Yeah, no, it, it's just... Bag in hand, Lee backs out and shuts the door. Inside room 119, at night. 
Lando sits comfortably in a shitty upholstered chair shoved into the corner of his room. The room's dark, as if he was sitting there when the sun went down and hasn't bothered to get up and turn the lights on yet. When he hears the sound of the station wagon's door closing, he inclines his head. He waits a beat, then stands. Strolling to the window, he peers through the blinds. Lee turns to face the motel and we finally get a good look at her. Lee Larson, mid-40s and fashionably casual without even trying. A cosmopolitan kind of gal. Not somebody who would be checking into a shithole motel in the middle of nowhere. She scans the parking lot, then peers over her shoulder at the motel's sign. No vacancy? She's skeptical. Sure as hell seems vacant. The male journalist rolls the passenger side window down. You want me to wait until, like, you get in your room or something? Nope. Thanks for the ride. Lee bends her knees to pick up the briefcase and bowling ball bag and then starts walking toward the check-in booth. Yes, yeah, so, uh, have a good night. The male journalist watches Lee walk toward the check-in booth. He's unsure. This place looks sketchy. See you Monday. Instantly regretting how lame that sounded, he mentally kicks himself. With a big sigh, he rolls up the window and then reluctantly drives off. At the check-in booth, Lee steps up to the window and sets her luggage down. A piece of paper taped to the booth's window says, Cash Only. On the countertop in front of her, there's a small bell. Inside, Ryan's guffawing obnoxiously at the cartoons on the TV and doesn't bother to acknowledge her. Annoyed, Lee looks at the bell. Nope, she's not ringing the damn bell. Reaching into the booth, she grabs an open bag of corn nuts and tosses it at Ryan. Corn nuts fly everywhere. Shit, what the fuck? Oh. He catches a glimpse of Lee and shuts his mouth. Sour, he sizes her up. Lee smiles, then pokes the bell with her index finger. It dings pleasantly. Ryan looks longingly at the TV, but leans forward and sticks his joint in an ashtray. He scoots his chair over to the countertop and checks the guest book. Name? Larson. Lee. Uh, yeah. Room 105. Fully booked. Really. Yup. And this says you're all paid up? He frowns. That's unusual. Whatever. He slides a room key across the countertop. Oh, shit. He turns toward the lined yellow notepad that's sitting next to the phone. Ryan tears off the top sheet and holds it out for Lee. Here. Her brow wrinkles warily, but she takes it. The note, scrawled out in the stoner's janky writing, If you need me, call. I love you. It's signed, Carl. Pursing her lips, she crumples the note and shoves it into her jacket pocket. Then she grabs the room key off the countertop. Is that it? I mean, you owe me for the corn nuts. Mm, what's that? Nothing. Right. Where do I find the concierge? Huh? Enjoy the cartoons, kid. She leaves. She leaves. Ryan scoffs. He scoots back to the TV and almost immediately starts laughing again. Back in the parking lot, Lee walks to room 105. She examines her surroundings while trying to pretend she's uninterested. The lot remains silent and somehow foreboding. Even Ryan's laughter can't be heard from here. She eyes the luxury sedan. That doesn't look right. The owner could sell it and buy the entire motel. Sticking the room key into the lock, she opens the door. Inside Lee's memory room, flashback. Inside the black abyss of Lee's memory, a park bench sits underneath a spotlight, as if there's a street light somewhere above it. Everything beyond the bench vanishes into the darkness of the ether, like nothing else exists. Lee, who looks a decade younger, walks into the spotlight and stands there. She's uneasy. Peering off into the darkness, Lee appears to be looking for something or someone. She takes a seat on the bench and pulls a notepad and a pen from her jacket pocket. Seconds pass. Close on Lee's hands, drumming both ends of the pen on the notepad, super fast, back and forth like a seesaw. Ms. Larson? That startles Lee. She looks over her shoulder at the informant, a silver-haired gentleman in his late 60s wearing a trench coat and scarf. He's carrying the same bowling ball bag we saw Lee with at the motel. 
He walks around the end of the bench, places the bag on the ground, and takes a seat. They're both at either end of the bench with more than enough room for the Holy Spirit between them. He doesn't look at her, but she examines him, intrigued yet guarded. You're interested. Occupational hazard. More than you could ever imagine. He bends over, picks up the bag, and sets it on the Holy Spirit's lap. That's it. Should I handcuff it to my wrist? Well, if it does what you claim, you should graft it to your forehead. I assure you, Ms. Larson, I have not exaggerated its usefulness. He places his hand on the bag and slides it a few inches toward her. She stares at it, doubtful. I don't have money. I have plenty. What don't you have, then? In due time. Try it first, then we'll talk. And Miss Larson, please, be very careful. <laughs> 